So Sharon, I should go ahead and mute until I'm needed. So yeah, we can all go ahead and mute. Then. Welcome everybody uh, signing on. We'll be ready to start in just a couple of minutes. Give it one more minute and give everybody a chance to sign on. Do you happen to be in the Upper Valley today? I can tell you that it feels like summer today in Hanover. Beautiful out. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Sharon Reed and I'm the Programs and Events Coordinator for the Hood Museum of Art. Welcome to today's Conversations and Connections, So Many Ways to Be Human. Um, I wanted to let you know that we are recording today's program. It will be available on YouTube um, in the following days if you wanna access it there, if you know someone who uh, missed it and would like to see it. Uh, they can find it on our YouTube channel. I am going to launch a very quick marketing poll in a moment. If you would take a quick second to just uh, answer the multiple choice question, we'd appreciate it. And I will be adding some Zoom housekeeping tips into the chat room. If at any time you have questions for our panelists um, or technical questions that also, please enter them into the chat. If you have questions about the program, put them into the Q&A at any time. You don't have to wait till the end of the program um, because sometimes I know I tend to forget if I wait. Um, so feel free to pop those in whenever, uh, whenever you think of them. And now I would like to turn this over to my colleague, Jamie Powell, Curator of Indigenous Art. Thank you, Sharon. And I will not close the poll this time because sometimes yes. I do that. I'm like, what is this thing that pops up and then I cancel it? So I won't do that today. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, but also, and as always, thank you for all the work you've put into making today's program possible. I'm really grateful for all the work that you do to make these virtual as well as our public events um, happen. I'd like to begin with acknowledging that the Hood Museum of Art is situated upon the ancestral and unceded lands of the Abenaki peoples. This acknowledgement reminds us of the significance of place, the continued existence of indigenous peoples, and the museum and Dartmouth's commitment to building respectful relationships with all those who call these lands home today. I couldn't be more excited to introduce to you all our uh, amazing guests for today. Uh, Anita Fields is a personal favorite of mine, not only in terms of her art, but just as a fellow human. Um, I uh, have followed Anita's work uh, the entire time I've been interested in art since I was an undergraduate, um, but have known Anita as a fellow citizen of the Osage Nation um, most of my life. Uh, and so to be able to work with her um, in this capacity has just been a really rewarding and affirming experience for me uh, in my career. Uh, so to introduce Anita, uh, born in Oklahoma, Anita Fields is a contemporary Native American multidisciplinary artist of Osage heritage. She is known for her works, which combine clay and textile 
with Osage knowledge systems. Fields explores the intricacies of cultural influences at the intersections of balance and chaos found within our existence through early Osage concepts of duality, such as earth and sky, male and female, which are represented throughout her work. Her sculptures have been featured in many solo and group exhibitions, including the 2020-2021 Weaving History into Art, The Enduring Legacy of Shan Ga Shorn at the Gilcrease Museum, Form and Relation, Contemporary Native Ceramics here at the Hood, and uh, Hearts of Our People uh, at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, which also traveled elsewhere. Um, these are just a few of those exhibitions. Fields work can be found in several collections, including the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian, the Museum of Art and Design, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, the Heard Museum, and of course, right here at Dartmouth within the Hood Museum of Arts collection. Fields was a 2017 to 2019 fellow through the Kaiser Foundation's Tulsa Artist Fellowship Program uh, and is still working with that organization as a Tulsa Artist Fellowship Integrated Arts Grant awardee. She is the invited artist for the 2021 Idle George Museum of Contemporary Art Fellowship and was recently named a 2021 National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellow. Our other guest, uh, many of you know here at Dartmouth, is Jenny Swanson. Jenny Swanson grew up in Seattle, Washington and attended Bennington College in Southern Vermont, where she studied ceramics with Jane Abersold and Stanley Rosen. She received an MFA in ceramics, working with June Kaneko at Camp Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan. Uh, she maintains a studio in Cornish, New Hampshire, where she makes sagar fired sculptural vessels and high fired glazed ceramics. She has been the director of the ceramic studio uh, at the Hopkins Center for the Arts at Dartmouth since 2004 and loves the history of ceramics, has traveled the world looking at clay work. Uh, and her work is in the collections of the Shangyu Museum in China and in public and private collections in Turkey, the UK, South Korea, and right here in the United States. Uh, I also just wanna say that Jenny is an incredible colleague, um, had, was an integral for, force in making uh, form and relation contemporary native ceramics happen. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with her. And even though we're doing this event virtually and not in person, I hope that the three of us can uh, in the future come together in person and have some kind of event um, with the ceramic studio um, and to see you both in action. So to get us started, um, is there anything that any that either of you would like to say um, to introduce yourself further before we get going with questions? I would like to make uh, say something, Jamie, if I could. Thank you for that uh, introduction. And I'm really thankful to be able to be here with you and Jenny today. I appreciate all of your efforts in making this happen. And I too can't wait for us to be able to, to work together in person um, there with some kind of project. I, look, I would really look forward to that. So I'm just grateful to be here today. And uh, thank you for everything that you do in terms of um, contemporary Native art. Um, you're very generous and kind and, and helpful and uh, connect a lot of people together. So it's important. Um, I just wanted to thank Jamie for um, making me part of this conversation today. It's, it's great to meet Anita and I look forward to her coming to Dartmouth sometime in person. And the students love hands-on here, so it would be great to have her making in our, our wonderful studio here. Um, and, and thanks again to Jamie and Morgan Freeman for bringing Anita's work to this to the hood so that the community can experience it and and so we can share it with others so i'm so thrilled to to um have the the exhibit open i've everybody's been loving it so it's so great that we can go in person now awesome so um i'd like to start with the um the piece that you know is the 
in some ways the, the beginning and, or the center of our conversation, um, this installation of 30 ceramic figures that's titled So Many Ways to Be Human. Uh, one anecdote, and I know some of you have heard me say this before that I like to share with people, is that this is the wall uh, during the reopening of the museum after the renovation where the Pablo Picasso was hung. And so I, I took down Pablo Picasso and put up Anita. Um, and I really enjoy telling people uh, that uh, little <laughs> fact about this show. Uh, so Anita, can you talk a little bit more about this piece? And I'll, I'll scroll through some images um, of the works while you do so. Okay. So, uh, so, wait, so many ways to be human, you know, lots to, to say about this. I have been, um, you know, my, my work kind of comes under three or four, um, you know, areas, and that would be figurative, landscape, um, clothing, shelters, um, kind of, I kind of stay within that realm, you know, in, in all of my work, but I do a lot of different kind of figurative work, which this certainly falls under. And I've been actually making these figures, hand building them, um, you know, through, uh, I form them by pinching them, by shaping them, by uh, using tools to just, you know, shape out a leg or arm. Uh, I've been doing this, I've been making these for a very long time. And, and what I enjoy about them is, is, you know, when I can go back and look at when I first started making these to how they have evolved into what they are today. Um, so, you know, being able to make an installation like this gives me an opportunity to have multiples, which many times when I'm working, I wish I had, because I'll just begin working on something and then these other ideas start sprouting and, and I'm thinking, oh, I wish I had three or four of these because I could do it, you know, it could be, um, it could be done in this way or I could, you know, change this about it. So this really gave me that opportunity to kind of uh, make an expression in, in, in lots of different ways, which is sometimes when I'm just working on one or two, you know, individual pieces, I don't have that opportunity. So like I said, they are uh, hand formed, you know, I make them in pieces and then join them together. Like for instance, I'll make the legs, I make the body, I make the head and the neck. And you know, these are all just kind of joined together old school way. And, uh, but, but for the bigger pieces, you know, I do, I do just kind of pinch those out until they feel um, appropriate, you know, till they feel like they're the shape I want them to be. So you can see there are all kinds of, you know, there are all kinds of shapes. They're, you know, they're thin, they're big, they've got long legs, they've got long necks, they've got, you know, all kinds of hairstyles. Um, I work also in this, you know, black and white because it kind of goes back to what we, you were talking about earlier in terms of uh, Osage knowledge systems and thinking about in duality and the relationship between the earth and sky, which is uh, Osage thought in terms of our relationship to uh, nature and the cosmos. So I'm kind of thinking of these kinds of things. And I think that black and white palette really allows me to uh, make that in a more expressive way than maybe I would in some other ways. Um, so I just use a black underglaze and I use a white underglaze or a white slip that I make and use these little applicators, you know, to, uh, to make the patterns and designs on there. Uh, and, and a lot of times if you turn them around, there's a whole different, which people can't even really see, but there's a whole different design system going on, you know, on the back of them, which, and oddly enough, I, I usually like the back better, <laughs> which you can't really see, you know, so um, that happens a lot of times. I use, um, for the bodices, uh, you know, some of them don't have a collage. Some of them are, uh, just have the gold luster glaze designs on them. I collage with all kinds of materials. I have these great boxes of scraps uh, from tiny to, you know, larger scraps. I use, I collect linen handkerchiefs. I collect linen scarves and silk scarves. And, you know, if I'm at, at a place at a, um, you know, an antique store or something like that, I just, I kind of like to rifle through their, uh, you know, their, the, 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 fabrics and the fiber kind of pieces that they have, because I think they really match well with this palette, you know, that I have developed. So for instance, on one, two, three, four, the fourth one in on the top row, that is like an embossed handkerchief. 
So I feel like it fits well with a lot of the uh, stamping, you know, that I do with handmade stamps because it's kind of the opposite of that, um, that directness. I use, um, I do a lot of, like in my fiber work, I, I do a lot of printing on silk or have that technique done on, you know, a commercial printer. And it's so beautiful that printing on silk is just, is, is so, it's very, it's real luscious and it feels, you know, it just feels really wonderful to the touch. Um, so even if I have the most minute scrap of that, I put it in that box and I will often, you know, find uh, little, um, little scraps of maps or uh, little scraps of writing. Um, because a lot of times, you know, when I have that process done, I will have um, very smaller versions of it made just so that I can check, you know, to make sure that it's balanced in terms of, um, uh, you know, tone and color and that kind of thing. So I will have these small, very small versions of it done. And I can't hardly bear to cut them up, you know, <laughs> because they're just so wonderful, you know, it, as they are, those little, you know, those they're like little maquettes. So, um, you know, sometime I'll be thinking of something that I can do with those, but they're available to me. And sometimes I do have to cut them up. And so then they become pieces on, you know, these larger pieces. I use inks, I use um, handmade paper, all kinds of paper, all kinds of paper, you know, combination of the paper and uh, fabric. Um, you know, if I think ahead far enough, you know, then I can think, well, if I, you know, for instance, if I want to add collage, but I also want the gold luster. So then, you know, I have to kind of be thinking ahead of where, where do I want that gold luster to be in relationship with uh, the collage, which you kind of see down here on the bottom row. I use a lot of information, you know, related to uh, um, Osage people, to documents. I um, research documents, you know, from all kinds of sources. And actually, since I was a very young person, I have been keeping um, anything that I would read about Osage people, I would just have that copied and, you know, started keeping them in boxes. And my daughter has started doing the same thing. So it's really interesting when we get together, at, for, we had a specific project and I didn't realize she was doing the same thing that, that I did. And so, but together with both of our resources, because she, you know, she's a, um, knows how to do research, you know, in a, in a much more in-depth way than I do. And so between the two of us, we had a lot of information, a lot of really interesting information. But one of the sources that I like to go to is that first Osage dictionary um, that was made by La Flesh. And La Flesh was an ethnographer um, in, the, in the 1800s that did a lot of documentation of Osage people. So that I, I really, actually, I love reading that dictionary just like it's a book. So I take a lot of information out of that. I'll scroll to another, oh, oh, oh the wrong way. There's a close up of. Yeah, that's that silk I was talking about with uh, a map of Osage County in Oklahoma. And in terms of those patterns, you know, that are on the uh, that are on the figures that I make with those applicators, I I I'll just you know when I'm working, I keep a piece of paper, a large piece of paper next to me, and just kind of experiment with different markings. And uh, you know, I think of those markings as as a couple of things. I mean, because my other work includes this distorted writing, also, which we're probably going to see in some of the images, you know, and and I kind of think of those as tools of survivance, you know, in, in terms of, uh, uh, because what I'm, one of the things that I want to do is I want to dispel, you know, the many myths and the many things that were written about us that were untrue, because as Osage people through our art and our culture and our language, we have always known who we are and we have always defined who we are. So I think of those marks as a tool of resistance in uh, trying to, um, you know, dispel those kinds of um, those kinds of things that were written about us in language. One of the reasons why I was really excited to bring Jenny into the conversation is because, uh, you know, as a curator with a limited knowledge of 
the actual practice of making ceramics. I was really excited to have Jenny join the conversation because she actually knows what you're doing um, in a way uh, and has a deeper understanding of kind of the material practices that you're using. Mm -hmm. um, Jenny, do you have any questions about these pieces after hearing Anita talk about them? Yeah, um, so many questions about these pieces. Um, so my main question is uh, really about intentionality a little bit, um, whether you see them as dolls. I, I think going to see them in the museum, you really, um, you really feel like you wanna pluck them off the wall and hold them, but they sort of have that feeling with the size and the scale and the organic softness of them. And um, I definitely was have been there with people that just say, I want one. And so I was wondering if you if, if that is your way of um, thinking about these figures and also, I was curious about the arms, about the stance and the arms. I think I counted five with arms and the others appear more um, as if the arms are sort of behind their back. And I was wondering if, if, if that was um, part of your plan <laughs> with most of them without visible arms or, or just how, how you felt about that. Okay. Um, to address a couple of the things that you first that you first said, so I, I do understand that they have very doll-like qualities, um, and I do understand part of that is because they appear to be cloth. I have so many times people think that they are, you know, that they're sewn or that they're made out of cloth, and and I believe that is just a connection to you know my great love of material and fabric and learning how to sew at such an early age that um, that kind of knowledge and practice can't help but kind of seep into you know, the clay work that I make. Um, I don't think of them as dolls. I think of them as just you know, what, we're, what we're calling them figures. Uh, but I do understand you know, that connection of, of people thinking about them in, in those terms. Um, as far as arms go, I, I don't. I, so somebody asked me this question the other night, uh, you know, on a on a Zoom, and I was I was saying I don't I don't ever think of them as, as missing something, you know that that uh, they don't have that they're that they're devoid of something, um, because I actually think of them as representing the human spirit. And so in terms of representing the human spirit, I feel like they just have to be um, the essence of, of the body, um, the, you know, the essence of who we are as human beings. And sometimes that just calls for arms, you know, sometimes that calls for making an expression um, that has arms, you know, to, to, to be, um, you know, emote feelings and, um, and you know they definitely. I mean, because you know when I'm making a, a big body like this, I can't sit down and make those in a few days. You know, it takes me a while. So um, I would say that they definitely relate to. Um, you know, I don't feel the same way every time I walk into the studio. You know, as a human being myself. You know, uh, so they definitely have relation to. You know, what's kind of happening with me in my life also during that time period. So if we're ready, did you have another question, Jenny, before I move on to the next work? Um, no, you can go ahead and move on to this one. We can go, we can go back also. Uh, so this is another work that's on view in the exhibition um, called Reconstruction Conversion Here. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this piece, Anita? Sure. So I completed this piece after an Andy Warhol residency at the Heard Museum. Well, that was probably 15 years ago, around that time period. Uh, and part of that residency allowed for travel uh, to do some research. So I chose to go to Mexico City and to uh, look at a lot of Omec work 
and a lot of um, you know prehistoric work, you know, from tribal people down there, and uh, it, it was wonderful. You know, the experience was just really was really wonderful. But this this is addressing a lot of the you know I I heard so many things, I saw so many things, I felt so many things. Uh, you know, one of the things that I really enjoyed was this that that the, the culture. Uh, that existed there, you know, the, the indigenous culture that was the, you know, the original, that was the original homelands. I felt their presence, you know, really strongly. And that's because of everything that is evident there in terms of landscape, in terms of, you know, what is left, in terms of, uh, it's, it's you, you really feel it and it's very evident, you know, that it hasn't been tried to be, just, well, they have tried to, you know, mow it down, but they weren't quite as successful as they have been here in the United States in terms of mowing down uh, land works and um, mounds and, and that, those kinds of activities that took place here in America. So, um, you know, it's real evident, you know, when you go to a lot of those uh, spaces and, and you know and start, you know, learning about the history of how they were all, all built, that they used the indigenous, that they tore down, you know, the indigenous people's um, sites and sacred sites, you know, to build these churches and, and then, you know, use the indigenous people to, um, teach them these different practices and techniques, you know, in terms of, you know, melting their gold, you know, to make into these other kind of ornaments and things. So this is, this is addressing that. And you can't see it really very, well, you can't see it at all in this photo, but that figure is sitting on these gold bars, you know, they're, they're clay gold bars that are covered in gold leaf. And so, um, you know, the, what I'm trying to say here is that despite all these terrible efforts, um, you know, to, um, to destroy uh, these places and people that indigenous people are still very present and, uh, and still very uh, connected you know, to their culture and still very, uh, that they didn't work, you know, that, these, that these practices that they had didn't work so that they still exist and still have very strong uh, cultural ties. So in terms of you know, hand building, it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's primarily hand built except for the figure. And uh, gosh, I made this so long ago. I think that the uh, the legs for that platform are actually, um, I think they made them around these kind of styrofoam cones and you know, just coiled and, and shaped and formed. But I also like the fact that they resemble organic um, roots and they, um, you know, they, they have that organic feel to them, but they also have a feel of, you know, like landscape and land. So, you know, I'm thinking of that in terms of, of, of base, you know, in terms of um, the importance here and, you know, what it is this, 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 um, this house is, is trying to express. So the house form, of course, is, represents can't tell you how many cathedrals and little chapels and you know that I visited and um, you know it's ju it's just so obvious and again that duality that duality of night and day of of of, of the uh, you know what happened there in terms of history um, you know again I'm always kind of looking at that duality so um, this house represents that and then on the top you know we have a beautiful you know, they have very beautiful organic uh, and really, you know, just giant size, <laughs> you know, plants and everything wherever you go there. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's carrying a multiple um, signals and multiple expressions. Um, yeah, that was one of the things that I really wanted to see when I was there were, were, the, uh, were, the, were the figures, you know, I was really interested in the figures. One of the really beautiful things about working with art and working with the public in an institution like this is the way that people bring their different experiences and understandings to an interpretation of the work. And um, more than, I think there's been two or three people now who have uh, talked about the figure on top and seen them as like arteries. Um, and asking if that's like representative of arteries and um, and I was like, I don't think so, but I'm sure she'd be excited to hear that. 
yeah. how do you feel about when that people bring these different interpretations that weren't necessarily in your mind to to your work? I like it. I like it because, of course, that's one of the what you know one of the things that you're trying to do is is uh, get you know what understand what people's reactions are because it's completely different from. Um, you know, the kinds of things that I'm actually thinking about many times. So I actually really like that uh, when people see something that I had not even uh, thought of, you know, that wasn't, wasn't in my thoughts when I was creating something. Um, I think it's really interesting, you know, how people respond, how, how we all respond, you know, to art. I mean, because I do that kind of thing myself, you know, I see things in something and and that may not have even been the intention of the artist. So, yeah, that's interesting. And I'm and I'm really glad that that that's what they saw. Another thing that is interesting to me about your work with the with um, slips uh, is that you're you were trained as a painter, uh, and so there's a very painterly quality to the way that you use slips and uh you know the the strokes that you use can you talk about the text and whether or not there is meaning um in the text if you're writing actual words we get a lot of questions about um that kind of uh the writing that you see here at the bottom oops sure so the writing is, is usually just a free form you know free free way of thinking uh and then um, just using like those applicators I was talking about. I mean, I have I have hundreds of them with different tips and everything. So just depending on how you know how big I want you know those markings to be or how small I want them to be, kind of determines you know what the applicator is that I will use. And then I just feel total freedom in um, you know, for instance, on this, you know, I'm talking about these kinds of experiences that I had. In, in just what I told you, you know, when I went down there and experienced these kinds of, you know, um, forms of erasure and forms of genocide, and you know, it was it was, it was real intense and it was real powerful, and so uh, that's exactly what I'm addressing in these words, but distorting it because I don't always feel like it's my job, you know, to just be so outward in saying uh, this is what I feel. It's kind of like it goes back to what you were saying, you know, I want people to be able to. Uh, perhaps jump on board with me. They don't have to know exactly what I'm saying, but perhaps, you know, there will be a part of them that connects to that and understand that it, it's, a, it's about uh, an experience, you know, that I had as an artist. And something interesting about, about that, you know, the markings and the, um, the freedom in making them and um, is that my son, I mean, Jamie knows this, my son is a painter and when he was young, when he left home, he went out to, to the East Coast, he went to art school, but he quit to join a graffiti gang. And so, you know, that was concerning. And so I would find myself kind of trying to go to the East Coast, you know, to check up on things every once in a while. And so, but, you know, it was really interesting because um, the, the group that he had joined, you know, they, they took me all around and I mean, oh my gosh, it was wonderful. And they, they had documented all of this. It wasn't just their work, it was everybody's work in these huge notebooks, you know. And that's the, I thought, oh, I really like that. I like how they use, um, I like how they use that distortion. You know, you know, it's hard to read, you know, you can read it if you really look closely, but a lot of times it's a train going by, you know, or something. So you don't have time to do that. It looks like a movie kind of going before you. So um, I, I like, I really like that. And I know that it had a big influence on me in terms of, um, you know, where I was going next with some things. I like that the idea that there's, you know, um if it's less legible, it forces people to spend more time with it mm -hmm. uh, and to look closer and to be more thoughtful about their interaction with the work. I have a question. Can you still see me? Because I'm like, my screen just kind of compressed. Yeah, we can see you. Okay, I'm gonna leave it alone then. <laughs> <laughs> because I might just be out of here in a minute if I try something else. <laughs> Anita, I was curious how you got into um, using gold in your work. In this piece, I think you said that you use gold leaf and mm -hmm. in the others, more like a, a luster. So 
um, and the extra firing afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe. And, um, was this one of the first pieces that you used gold as part of it? And kind of, sort of, I mean, I started experimenting with the gold leaf first before I started using the luster. And I still, I can tell you quite honestly, I still have not mastered luster, you know. Uh, sometimes it works really well for me and sometimes it does not. So I don't know what, you know, all of the idiot, you know, syncrasies that, you know, have to, the nuances that about gold luster glaze. I don't know how sometimes I can make it look perfect. And then the other times it's just, it's, it's you know, it's not near anything like that then that leads me to having to probably doctor the surface sometimes with gold leaf, you know, just turning it around to, well, I'm probably just gonna scrap that and, and use gold leaves. So I, I really love gold. I like how it can represent uh, something very precious and that can be in terms of knowledge or that can be in terms of um, just how precious, you know, something is to, to people, how important it is to people also, the idea of illumination, the idea of light, the uh, you know, and that goes into a lot of my work deals with transformation because I feel like using the gold, whether it's the gold luster or gold leaf, I feel like that really adds to that uh, luminosity, you know, in, in trying to make those expressions. Sorry, Jenny, I don't want to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. The timing of these events is much harder um, in virtual than it is on um, of a conversation uh, in person. Uh, but um, this is the, the third and final piece of uh, Anita's work that's currently on view at the hood. Um, this was a commissioned piece and is part of the museum's permanent collections. It is called When Referencing the Earth and Sky. Um, one of the uh, things that was important to my co-curator Morgan Freeman and I on this project was that we bring in a work by each of the artists in the exhibition to the permanent collections. And so from Anita, um, I wanted a landscape. Uh, I'm a huge fan of your landscapes, but I also really wanted to have the opportunity at some point um, to put your work in conversation with kind of the, you know, Hudson School landscapes that we have in the collection already. Um, and there's, you know, this, there's a long history of landscape art as a cornerstone of American artistic practice. Um, can you talk about how you began doing landscapes and tell us a little bit more about this work? Mm -hmm. So, um... I'm gonna kind of go way back actually to the time that I was a student at the Institute of American Indian Arts, where, as you said earlier, you know, I was uh, trained to be a painter. And kind of along the way, what happened was I started, you know, working in the clay studios there and felt like my work was, I was just really drawn to the clay. I mean, to the idea of transformation, the idea of, you know, spontaneity. Uh, and, I, you know, I just really connected with the touch and I connected with it in terms of, uh, it's the earth, you know? And so um, if I look at my work, you know, whether it's a print or a painting or even a piece of clay, the landscape kind of format that I particularly use is, is still related to some of those really early works, you know, in terms of uh, kind of an abstracted uh, folding of the land you know, where the land kind of, it, it, it just, it just uh, is fluid and, and, you know, one, one hill, you know, just kind of flows into the next one. And then there might be an instance of water, you know, in terms of using the slips that I use or the textures, you know, like with the um, handmade stamps. Um, I can't see it, but do you have that piece up? That landscape? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, so one of the biggest things, you know, that kind of happened to me was that I started, um, had the opportunity to start traveling with groups of Osages who were going to original homelands, you know, and to important sites, you know, that were important in our history and in terms of our movement, you know, west and then finally down into, you know, what is 
Indian territory, what was Indian territory, you know, nowadays Oklahoma. So I felt very privileged and honored to be able to do that. And it had a really um, profound impact on um, how I started thinking about landscape. You know, number one, just using clay and knowing how clay is formed and shaped by the earth itself and how long that process takes. Uh, you know, you know that you're working with something that has evolved, you know, over um, many, 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 many years. And so by visiting those um, original homelands, you know, I had this, this really, uh, really uh, intense feeling of uh, understanding that that landscape holds a memory also, you know, just like clay holds a memory or how we hold memory or how we think of things. You know, it was very clear to me that, that the landscape holds memory also of the cultures who were first there, of the cultures who lived there, who left there. Uh, that kind of goes along to what I was saying about, you know, that trip to Mexico City or whenever I travel anywhere, you know, and, and, and start thinking about landscape and start thinking about history, start thinking about the people who were originally there. So that is, you know, the essence of all those kinds of thoughts and feelings are, are what I'm trying to say in my landscapes. And so, um, I feel very free in terms of in that particular landscape I started using and it's they're kind of abstracted and you probably can't unless you look really really close um, in the bottom portion of that landscape you will see these little um, they're like lodges the uh, shapes of the lodges that we used as Osage people and so I'm thinking of them as still remaining there, you know, the remnants that uh, the places where they were at, that 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 memory is still there of, of those villages being there. And so that is represented by those abstracted uh, lodges. And so then they just become part of the pattern, you know, they become part of the uh, abstracted patterns, you know, that I'm using. And then there's a, the, you know, the distorted word again, you know, the, um, the markings. And so these are all part of that expression that I'm talking about. And again, when I'm making that distorted writing, I am thinking exactly of the kinds of things that I'm talking about. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about what it must have been like, you know, when our people were there at this site, what it means to me as an Osage people, as an Osage person or the group that I'm with when we were able to visit those kinds of sites. You know, they're, they're, they're very powerful experiences. And then, of course, we have that relationship that I talked about earlier between the earth and the sky. Um, Anita, I went, wondered if this piece um, feels closer to a textile um, piece to you. Um, it's it's more a little more two dimensional, and it it's sort of reads a little bit like a quilt, like a big three-dimensional quilt. And um, definitely uh, the pattern and the writing and the clouds um, sort of have, a bit, again, a very soft feeling like textile, which, it, which I think is, is very unusual. Um, I think of it more like a painting, but I think that's really interesting what you just said. <laughs> um, You know, I'm not sure if it's just the, the muted, uh, kind of devoid of a lot of color in my work mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, that make that pattern feel like it's cloth um, or, or, or fiber or fabric. Um, but I do know, what I know for sure is that it's just, like I said earlier, that it's very connected to my love of fabric and, uh, the loving um, memory of my grandmother teaching me how to sew and her basket full of these beautiful scraps. I know it's all related to that. I don't know exactly, you know, how, you know, but I do know that, 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 that there is a relationship to that. Do you, do you have um, a fiber practice and a clay practice going simultaneously at the same time? 
you. Yes, you. I do. How do you do that? <laughs> There's. I, you know, I, I didn't for a really long time, but I just, I love fabric so much and started thinking, you know, when I was making things out of clay, how that could, how that could translate in terms of fabric. Also, I, I'm, you know, one of the, one of the really big influences for me, of course, is our traditional Osage clothing. So that is a great influence on my work and the way I think about clay work and the way that I think about um, how I can use uh, those kinds of items as metaphors, you know, in terms of trying to translate uh, knowledge and trying to uh, talk about how how beautiful our how beautiful our culture is, in terms of uh, you know for, for we don't even really know how long, you know. Um, we, we just really don't even know how many, how many, you know, if you had to ask me, you know, how far back does that go? I would just say, have to say since the beginning, since we existed, you know, that this way of thinking about things, this way of placing things within the world and within the environment, you know, I, there's a direct correlation between our clothing and our culture, you know, to what it has evolved to today with still carrying those kinds of thoughts. So I, I think of it in terms of that, you know, and using those kinds of clothing articles, um, like I was talking about shelters, you know, any of this landscape, all of this, you know, is, is uh, related to a way of thinking um, about things, about placement in the world. I'm looking around in my office. I'm like, where do I have ribbon work that I could show? Yeah. Um, because a lot of people don't know what it is, uh, you know, and I, in looking at this piece, you know, it's, um, and Jenny's question really made me think about, you know, I know that you're thinking about like this duality that's evident, but it's also evident in kind of like the abstraction that is within Osage ribbon work practices and the idea of these, you know, having really contrasting colors um, present within those works. And, you know, as you mentioned, Anita, you know, a lot of that knowledge or, you know, how those things started um, is lost, but we know that there's meaning in that. And so I think sometimes what these conversations does, conversations do for me is to be like, oh yeah, they're probably, that is probably why we do some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, that, I mean, sometimes that just comes to you when you're, you know, kind of an awakening, you know, like, uh, I mean, I, I hear so many beautiful things about ribbon work, you know, and, and uh, where those two, you know, the two colors, your, your two base colors, you know, it's kind of like the meeting of the horizon, um, you know, the earth and the sky, that connection, you know, what, I'm, what, what we're talking about, um, you know, that's all represented in that. So in my you know, you, I mean, you won't be able to see this because, uh, but in those textures, you know, when I'm talking about stamping and that texture that I use in clay, um, for so long, I tried to replicate ribbon work in clay. And I was just like going, ribbon work is ribbon work, clay is clay, ribbon work is supposed to be done with satin <laughs> because you're not gonna capture, you know, the integrity of, of ribbon work and those beautiful stitches and, you know, the thoughtfulness that goes into it in clay. So finally, I started taking my patterns and just impressing them in the clay to make stamps out of them. And then I'm being able to use those stamps on, you know, press them into the moist clay and I will have a remnant of ribbon work in there. Uh, even if it's just a tiny scrap, because, you know, really I just tear them apart and, you know, add them in, in collage fashion, you know, to my, to my uh, kind of, um, you know, when the clay has started drying out a little bit. It's not bone dry, it's, you know, it's, it's not real soft. It's that in-between stage. So now um, I wanna be mindful of time. And so I'm gonna show some of your new works, but also wanna encourage folks from the audience who have questions to, to put them in the Q&A. Um, Right now, Anita, I don't know if you can see the screen, but we're looking at a, a, a it's a bullhorn mm -hmm. piece that you've created. Um, and maybe while we're waiting for some questions to come in, you could talk a little bit about this piece. So, uh, 
I, I had it in my head that I wanted to create, um, you know, a, a megaphone, a bullhorn, uh, in terms of you know to represent all of the activity that we were seeing during COVID, uh, all of the different types of movements that have always existed, but seem to come you know forward in such a, uh, a powerful way. Um, of the need for change. And so I, you know, like most people, you know, think that the arts are, you know, the catalyst or can be a really strong, powerful catalyst for, for social change in terms of uh, a way to help people look at things in a manner that maybe is not so uh, intimidating for them. You know, to kind of start, start thinking of uh, social issues in a way that, uh, no matter how they think about those social issues, but you know, inviting them to to examine examine you know what's happening in the world. So I thought I thought well, I'm going to make and hopefully I can make a little series you know of, of megaphones. And again, you know, using the gold in terms of this is precious and important information. So the inside of it is all gold leaf, and and the outside in the rim is gold luster glaze. So we have a question um, from another artist, uh, Brenda Garand, who asks, uh, jumping off of Jenny's analogy to a quilt and sewing, your landscape envelops the human completely. It's protective and familiar. Do you want the viewer to be enveloped by the history of place, vulnerable in the landscape? Uh, absolutely, yes. Because again, you know, as individuals, uh, depending, you know, on what our background is, we all have um, our idea of place and time and history. So I'm fine with with uh, folks feeling a, a part of that. Sorry, now my computer's frozen. Oh, hold on, let me go back. I did this earlier too. Okay. Um, well, and I, I see a connection here between the, the bullhorn uh, piece uh, and this piece of the figure here with the fist up. Um, a lot of people are drawn to this figure in particular. And I'm curious about the fact that, you know, this is one of the pieces that has arms, um, but also doesn't have anything on the torso. Was that um, an intentional choice or um, just the way it happened? That was intentional because if I, you know, if, if I cover it in the uh, design and patterns, then I don't have any intention of, you know, making a collage there. Um, so, I really like that one too. <laughs> yeah, you know, they represent all kinds of things, all kinds of people. Like, I mean, gosh, just you know, the, so many ways, or so just so many ways for us to look at things, so many ways to, to be who we are. And, you know, and all of our, you know, like you mentioned earlier, you know, our vulnerabilities and, um, you know, being strong and, and, and being curious and, you know, thinking about, you know, how, how do you shape yourself? I mean, I think there's a lot of words that I can use that just go along with, because again, I have found clay to be so representative of, of a human being, you know? I mean, just when I use the words of how to shape yourself in the world, I mean, you know, just the, the kind of words that you use sometimes to describe clay are just descriptions of, of human beings. Uh, even those subtle, you know, the subtle shape of clay that we think of in just terms of a vessel or the earliest kinds of makings of things, you know, that were utilitarian, they have that human shape, um, you know, sig significantly. So um, I, I don't think we can separate that. Yeah. And one of the conversations that Morgan and I had when we were thinking about this show was the idea of clay in whatever form um, it takes as a vessel mm -hmm. in the same ways that, you know, you can think about our bodies as vessels. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question about um, one of the figures, um, there's gold luster on one foot, but not the other. 
a lot of them, um, and again, you know, there are some uh, determinations that have to be made while I'm making things. So uh, for instance, if I'm gonna use the gold glaze, I have to put, you know, a clear glaze over that section. So, you know, I would have to think, well, I just want this one to have one gold foot or one gold, you know, kind of uh, leg. So then I wouldn't put clear glaze on the other one. So th those are just really, you know, as I'm making them and kind of thinking ahead in terms of, um, I just like, you know, the difference of it's, it's, I can't, if there's some meaning there, I haven't figured that out, you know, in terms of it, but um, yeah, some of them just, they're just design, you know, elements. Anita, you said that, I think the caption um, for the piece said that all the figures were female and uh, connected to your, um, the strong female voices in your, in your past, um, Osage strong leaders. Um, are they all female, all, all the figures? I, I mean, it's, it's kind of, they're all sort of magical and, and, and it's not totally clear that they're female, but I was just wondering if, if you could Yeah, because a lot of them are related, you know, to female, uh, female spirit. And, uh, but once I start making the figures, some of them I'm thinking they're definitely male while I'm making them, you know. And the purses that we just saw, um, are those are those recent pieces? That one is, but I've been also making a series of purses for quite a while. And uh, so a lot of my work is based on memory, you know, experiences that I had as a young person, things that I found comfort in, things that, you know, remain, have remained with me um, as uh, powerful experiences or that kind of started shaping and forming the way that, you know, the ways that I look at things and think about things. And um, my grandmother gave me when I was a little girl, a, um, it's shaped like this, um, a fully beaded purse, an, an older one. And so that's something, you know, that I've had throughout my lifetime. And the first ones actually began, I was actually trying to emulate the, the you know, through pointillism and uh, slips, the, the beaded patterns, you know, that would be found on something like that. And then they evolved into just all kinds of patterns and uh, expressions, you know, and then the purse, of course, you know, it just, you know, can carry. Uh, and this is the way I look at, at clothing, you know, too, when I'm talking about shelters and clothing is that, you know, it, it just represents so much, it's symbolic of so many things in our lives. Um, I can tell you when I was, you know, 26 years old that my purse had baby bottles in it and pacifiers and snacks and, you know, I mean, it <laughs> loaded down, you know, and, and uh, so I was constantly just, you know, like taking out everything, putting it on a table, trying to find my keys or something like that, you know. So, you know, throughout these time periods in our lives, you know, that, that changes. Um, so, I'm, you know, I'm always kind of thinking about, you know, the purse is, you know, very symbolic, can be very symbolic for us in terms of what we carry and in terms of, um, and, and that can be good or bad, you know, in terms of what we carry, how we think about things. Um, you know, when I, when I talk about carrying something, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, is that a burden or, or is it something positive? You know, again, kind of going back to this vulnerability of being human, um, my belief, I, I, I don't think I'm wrong, you know, is that everybody, <laughs> you know, is faced with all these kinds of different things. You know, life is all of these things. It's joyous, it's sad, it's grief, it's pain, it's happiness. It's, you know, it's like, you know, the ultimate, you know, in being happy, you know, so, you know, we experience all these things as human beings. And so I'm often thinking about all of those kinds of things, you know, that is that, that how we walk through um, our lives, you know, and our journey. So um, I wanna take time for one last question that came in um, and it's about this, uh, the purse and the, the bundle. Um, and 
they say, uh, ask if it is a bundle and said that they've seen that in other pieces you've done. Um, is that a theme of your work? Can you mm -hmm. speak about that? Mm -hmm. So the bundle, yeah, that is a bundle and that's supposed to be a little tiny bundle probably made out of something like a handkerchief. Um, that was another thing my grandmother used to do. She used to like carry a handkerchief and then she would put jewelry in it, rings. I mean, I even, I, I like to say, yeah, there you go. I like to say that um, um, one time I saw her put a chicken, a chicken, a chicken leg <laughs> and tie it up in this handkerchief and throw it in her purse, you know? So, um, but as, as Osage women, you know, we're taught to kind of go to our dance, you know, if we're going to have a giveaway or if we're, if we're just carrying our shawl, you know, the things that we need to attend to it, you know, to attend and dance with, uh, we would put that in a scarf, you know, or a bundle, a piece of material, a piece of fabric, and we would attend the dance that way. Uh, but that is also a very universal feminine woman uh, activity, you know, to do all over the world, you know, people utilize the scarf, a piece of fabric in terms of carrying, uh, of attending things, of bringing something, you know, and, and I'm always thinking too, you know, when I talk about those kinds of things is, is uh, also, you know, what do we take when we attend events like that? What do we take away from that? Yeah, and once again, Clay's ability to hold knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, well, we are unfortunately at time. Um, Anita and Jenny, thank you so much for being in conversation um, with one another and with me today. Uh, and for those of you who are attending, um, if you haven't seen the exhibition, um, we are open to the public. Um, if you aren't able to come to the museum, there is a virtual exhibition, um, a Matterport uh, exhibition. Um, on the Hood's website under the exhibition page for form and relation that you can uh, explore through um, to see these works um, in that space as well. So thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Anita. It's always so fun to hear artists talk about their work. So thank you for being very generous and telling us everything. It's great. I'm glad to. Thank you, Jamie. It's great to be here. <laughs>